All right, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, happy kickoff to Latino Heritage Month as well. Uh, welcome students, staff, faculty, and guests attending this distinguished speaker series, both here in person in Mumford Hall, as well as those of us uh, joining online. My name is Nathan Castillo. I'm an assistant professor and the diversity, equity, and inclusion officer for the College of Education. Um, I'll be serving as your moderator, and in that capacity, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the speaker series and introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Cesare Warren. But first, as a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piancasha, Weya, Miami, Mascouten, Odawa, Sok, Meskwaki, Kikapu, Pontawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all of our differences with Native peoples at the core of our efforts. I would also like to acknowledge our generous sponsors um, from the College of Education, the Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Education Committee, as well as the Dean of our college, Dean Cristal Lamosa, for your leadership and support of this speaker series. The 2022-23 Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series aims to facilitate conversation with preeminent scholars in education. This prestigious invita invitational speaker series builds on our historic and current University of Illinois efforts related to community and public engagement and increasing expectations of addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in schools, workplace, and our general society. Ultimately, the speaker series aims to reimagine our role as a university, um, actors, catalysts, and social change agents, and to spark ways to take accountability, advocacy, and action amidst the challenges and opportunities of building a more equitable, just, and empowered institution and global community. Dr. Warren is our first distinguished speaker of the series, but please also join us for our other exciting speakers we have planned for the spring. Professor Joy Gaston Gales of North Carolina State will be here March 6th. Professor Tiffany Lee of the University of New Mexico on April 11th. Dr. April Baker Bell of Michigan State will join us on April 24th. And Professor Margaret Veal Spencer of the University of Chicago on May 2nd. More detail about their respective visits will be available shortly. And now, it's my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Cesare Warren, who is the Associate Professor of Equity and Inclusion in Education Policy at Peabody College, Vanderbilt University, affiliated faculty in African American and Diaspora Sto Studies, and faculty head of house for a first-year residence hall at Vandy. A 2005 elementary ed alum, Myron and Jewel Ash Scholar and Jean F. Hill Awardee from the Office of Minority Student Affairs here at the University of Illinois. Dr. Warren was a secondary math teacher and school administrator in Chicago before entering the professoriate. He is the recipient of numerous national recognitions for his scholarship, including the 2014 Outstanding Dissertation Award from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, two American Education Research Association Early Career Awards, and a 2017 Critics' Choice Book Award from the American Education Studies Association for his first sole authored book, Urban Preparation, Young Black Men Moving from Chicago's South Side to Success in Higher Education, published by Harvard Ed Press. Dr. Warren is a 2019 National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow and has held visiting faculty appointments at Stanford University, University of Pennsylvania, at New York University. Let us all now welcome Dr. Cesare Warren. Thank you. Good 
Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. Ah. <laughs> One thing at a time. There we go. I'm just going to get some water, which I should have done already, but that's fine. So much love in the room. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here and to share space with all of you. Um, so many familiar faces in the room. My undergraduate advisor, the woman responsible for me becoming a teacher, uh, Ms. Dr. Viola Harris, who I, I just want to speak her name and appreciate her for her many contributions. I certainly would not be here without her. Um, my music instructor, I'm um, a black chorus alum, very proud black chorus alum. Dr. Davis, there's so many, and my dad, I can't forget my dad here. Um, <laughs> So thank you all so much for being here. And I don't want to, um, I could sort of gush about my time at Illinois, but I don't want to waste a lot of time here because the time is short and I want us to be able to be in some conversation. But I thought it'd be appropriate um, to just share a little bit about my journey from this campus to uh, Nashville, uh, where I'm an, uh, I'm just an assistant professor. I've actually gotten tenure. I'm an associate <laughs> professor, uh, and I'm happy to be there uh, and making contributions. There, but I left this campus really excited and eager to teach on the west side of Chicago. Uh, and I started my career in North Lawndale, end up in Austin, in an Austin community, and then again on the south side of Chicago. And what I learned pretty quickly was that I had all the book knowledge and none of the readiness uh, to encounter all of what I was going to encounter as a teacher. And I quickly learned um, that teaching was far more than the human interaction, the one on one. Um, especially in such a large bureaucratic school system like Chicago. And I started to ask myself lots of questions around the human dynamics of teaching and learning. And in particular, uh, found myself in a graduate program somehow with no expectation to actually complete it. If you can believe it, I started a PhD mostly because I thought, mm, keep my loans in forbearance and I can kind of just keep <laughs> learning. I'm very much a lifelong learner in that way. But also, I was looking for a reason to leave Chicago um, but couldn't explain to my grandmother why I had to go uh, when I could just teach in Chicago. So I thought, okay, if I get a PhD, that's a reason to go. But uh, I landed at the University of Illinois Chicago and I took a critical race theory course with Dave Stovall, who is also an, a distinguished alum of this institution. And I remember asking myself in that course um, the question on empathy. And if empathy was a thing, and I worked with a lot of well-intentioned white women teachers, um, very similar to the ones that I studied alongside when I was here uh, and their difficulty working with black boys. And it put me on this journey of discovery that sort of uh, have, has led to today. So in considering the theme of this series with DEIDIE, Advocacy and Action Towards Greater Accountability in an Empowered University, I want to ponder the subject of centering possibility, reimagining the equity imperative in American education. The project of imagination and possibility too often come on the heels of mourning or loss. And when we are suddenly, um, it's sort of a moment where we're suddenly forced to recognize and acknowledge forms of death that remind us of our own fragility and the consequence of our hands to be engaged in efforts that sustain human well-being first and foremost for all of us and especially those who've been the disproportionate subjects of institutional terror, harm, and wrongdoing. So I hope uh, in the few minutes that we have together that this talk will be an important intervention. So I want to start with a little story. July 12th, this is how I'll remember him. He'd just gotten his locks retwisted that day, and I noticed his hair first. In no rush, Spencer stylishly ambled into Federales, a millennial meetup hotspot in Chicago's West Loop. Sorry I'm late, Mr. Warren. Life had carried him so far since our initial introduction at Perspectives Middle almost 15 years earlier. So catch me up, man, I asked impatiently as he spoke about his son and his career moves. I reflected on the fact that Spencer was the physical manifestation of aspiration more than a decade in production. I was suspended in marvel as he spoke, peering into his eyes, looking through the glass darkly, and I beheld the substance of Spencer's persistence, commitment, sacrifice, and dedication despite numerous roadblocks. He was a survivor of stories known and unknown. And I was determined to reconnect with him, considering the human precarity that COVID invites 
and several years of too little contact. He lost his beloved grandmother, the woman who raised him, and for me, spending time with him this past summer was imperative. A mentor, a mentee, a former eighth grade math teacher, and his former student, drinking spicy margaritas, laughing boisterously as we caught up on a lot of life lived between the two of us. The picture on the left was snapped on our journey to Champaign in 2012, coasting south on I-57, as he forecasted his new life attending the state's flagship institution. Spencer was an exceptional athlete and erudite in every way. He was awarded a full academic scholarship here, which was such a big deal for him. He made his village so incredibly proud, and indeed, for me, he was possibility personified from the eighth grade classroom to the University of Illinois. But Spencer Sr. disrupted his studies here to ensure a future full of possibility for this beautiful baby boy to whom he'd had the deepest obligation. And he shared with me that day on July 12th how compelled he felt to provide for Spencer Jr., which meant he needed to quit school. And almost seven years later, it had taken him some time, but he found his way. He felt stable, grounded, and back on track. Sadly, on August 17th, one month and five days after our reunion, Spencer was reunited with his grandmother. And much like I'd done in years gone by, I spent our time together checking in on his well-being, musing about his goals, and challenging his, confidence, his lack of confidence with an unrelenting affirmation. Most important, I articulated in that moment, in the time that we spent together, my deep pride and love and respect for him. I realized I'd done my part and he'd done his. And while we bantered about his regrets, we rested in the cradle of his accomplishments. But this is how I choose to remember him on July 12th, relaxed, level-headed, even-tempered, brilliant, and ever-evolving into his best self, growing like these locks, all twisted up and complicated. In my book, Centering Possibility in Black Education, I reflect on the significance of possibility to transforming black people's education experience in the US. The protracted discussion of possibility that I pursue in the book is foremost obsessed with black education futures and far less with overemphasizing black people's anti-black educational past and present. Put differently, such an orientation of black education transformation does not imply one should discount or disregard past and present forms of suffering. It is to say, however, by actively acknowledging and learning to notice the everyday ordinariness of anti-blackness, one is better poised to glimpse possibility for an otherwise. The popular discourse in black education specific to the claim that American schools, colleges, and universities are sites of persistent pain and suffering for black people is indeed a compelling and essential social science. Such claims alone are inadequate, however, for inadequate preparation for remedying such suffering in real time. Knowledge of chattel slavery's residual consequence and the durable impact of settler colonialism is a starting point, not a stopping point. And for efforts aimed at advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, this too often means that we are privileging the present and not the future. And in my article, From Morning to Morning, I urge that unshackling ourselves away from the promises of American democracy and leaning into deeper revelation of black people's violent relationship to American empire constitutes an invitation to mourn. That is, to pause and to ponder what Kiana Rawson scholars in the Afro-pessimist tradition argue is the impossibility of black humanity and resist the compulsion to fix it. And by fix it, I'm referencing our propensity as educators and scholars in an applied field like education to want to find answers that aim to reconcile or repair, read, reform existing education systems. Systems imagined at a time when black flesh was simply a commodity to be bought and sold at will. Conversely, mourning rejects that these realities can ever be any different than what they are at present, which in turn gestures us to begin imagining what is possible on the other side of an inescapable tragedy or within and despite the realities of our racialized condition. Justin Greenwich at the University of Minnesota asks, 
How do black youth make sense of the racial traumas that afflict them and how or if they can find healing in the very same institutions that perpetuate their racial subjugation? He describes racial trauma as precipitating both melancholia and mourning. Melancholia or the harmful psychological effects of racism that mark how racism is processed within the mind and the body, but also mourning. He urges that communal efforts to resist racism and cope with racial trauma engender negotiations between both mourning and melancholia, and that it is out of these negotiations that possibilities for social change might emerge. Greenwich also describes mourning as a productive legislation of grief that perhaps demonstrates a flexibility for navigating between paralysis and agency. Similar to Greenwich, I wonder how endless mourning due to an unceasing engagement with racial trauma might lead to the process of healing and how notions of possibility both necessitate and emerge from our pain, especially now as a field when scholarship in black education increasingly foregrounds the particularities of black people's pain and suffering in education policy and practice. My consideration of possibility hinges on cultivating expansive considerations of mourning, indeed for reimagining the black or blackness such that ongoing discourses of anti-blackness in education do not inadvertently foreclose our capacities as scholars and lovers of black people to freedom dream. Similarly, two scholars from Howard University examined how black mothers whose children were the victims of race-related violence managed the grief of their loss they found that these women transformed their mourning into a catalyst for social ac action. al Ukta and Adamako argued that these mothers of the movement made a practice of moving grief to the public sphere to be shared by others. I find this to be instructive. Doing so enabled these women to reclaim power and agency stripped away by the untimely death of their children that they would later repurpose to advance the ongoing movement for black lives. Al Ukta and Adamako also insisted that the agency derived from these black women's widely broadcast despair helped to reshape their pain into healing. And that healing in turn became the context for noticing and seeding possibility. These scholars conclude that it was these black women's healing and belief in possibility that empowered them and ultimately led to the activism in service of a brighter future for all black people. I wonder about the significance of making one's grief legible broadcasting it for the world to see and forcing the public to physically encounter the subject of anti-black state violence. And I think about that in part similar to uh, the decision made by Mamie Till Mobley to unseal Emmett Till's body and what that meant for shocking the nation into the period of the modern civil rights movements of, of the uh, late 50s and, and mid 60s. Especially when making, the, making one's grief public what that means for then creating justice movements without leaders. So I began to talk with a story of my own personal mourning in part because I needed to give a face to possibility. Losing Spencer to a tragic accident literally moments before I welcomed my own first year uh, students who are now residents of Sutherland Houses as their faculty head of house. It stopped me in my tracks, literally moments before I went out to meet them, I learned of this news. Looking into their faces, much like I did when I was Spencer's teacher, reminds me of the urgency and seeming sort of inconsequence of our everyday ordinary decision making. Like with whom do we have lunch, or what student-led events do we attend on campus, or what partners to bring to the table for this initiative or that one. Talking about him has been about making my own grief legible in part, and then processing out loud reflection on moments gone by, which includes feeling the weight of my previous investments in Spencer and other young people like him, specific to the human dimensions of our work, to notice what they need unprompted, to acknowledge and to celebrate their passions, desires, and aspirations in a world that, sought to, that seeks to flatten and essentialize young men like him, to fit him into a race-gender trope, that would so easily ultimately erase him and invisibilize him. To see him, to remember, and to focus him as the subject and motivation of this work is to realign my own accountabilities and to think different about my role as an empowering agent moving forward despite my own position of influence in the university. 
This is especially significant for those students whose identities may rent, be rendered vulnerable in academic environments like this one, where their languages, forms of expression, ethnic backgrounds, and interests are generally underrepresented. It is easy for them to sort of slip through the cracks as we scramble to figure out how to include them, where to integrate them, uh, and make the case for where our work ought to lie. But Spencer Senior leaves in his wake memories of a life well lived and a son who now bears his name, who now has to find a way to live without him, the, the, the personal access to the physical embodiment of possibilities specific to him. And likewise, I consider mourning to not only be the space where one comes to term with, with our reality, but it's also the space after a period of lament where we build towards the future we all need and desire. A decade earlier than Robin D.G. Kelly, Derrick Bell contended in Faces at the Bottom of the Well, similar to France Fanon decades before him, that anti-black racist power structures may never be fully overthrown. This alone would be declaration for mourning. Yet each of these thinkers across three generations insist, and I agree, that resigning oneself to such a dark reality was an essential starting place for the longer project of black freedom necessary to undermine and undo anti-black oppressive systems. I'd argue that they mourned, but it is in and through that mourning that they beheld possibilities for the sort of theorizing that we appreciate them for today. My thinking about possibility is foremost informed by Kelly's Freedom Dreams, which is an uh, intellectual study of individuals who've been identified in the black power movement who are representative of the black radical tradition. Kelly describes in this intellectual history that these individuals were primarily motivated more by what they were fighting for rather than who or what they were fighting against. A focus on what one is fighting against mirrors an activism that is preoccupied with and fixated on the incessant assault and racial oppression of black people that we have long endured and resisted. Such logics are akin to sort of enduring night. If you've ever heard that song, ain't no need to worrying what the night is going to bring. Y'all heard that before? You know, one of the, that song, and, and uh, you know, I grew up in the Kojic church, and part of growing up in the Kojic church, you've probably heard... Um, Trouble don't last always, right? Joy comes in the morning. Part of my trouble with sentiments like that one, though well-meaning, is that they sort of think about nighttime and darkness as a thing to be escaped. And part of what morning and this kind of conception of morning and what Kelly is inviting us to do in terms of leaning towards what we're fighting for, i.e. black dignity and black humanity, it's an invitation to lean into the darkness and to lean into the space of blackness. A fighting for orientation to activism organ grounds an individual's labor in a vision of black people as people and possibility for who or what we can become in an anti-black world. Do we know who these folks are on the screen? Just yell them out. Mark Kwame Ture, Angela Davis, Ella Baker, Marcus Garvey. If we consider for a moment the images or schematics that occupy their imagination. Individuals who are identified as part of the black radical tradition, icons of the black power movement, when visioning the justice campaigns that we know them for today. In other words, when they thought of black people and blackness in America, considering the subject condition of their terror, right, the racial terror that they were encountering, and what it means for the lives that they were living the lives that their ancestors lived, but also the lives that they could live and what other black people could do beyond them. I wonder what they saw that drove them to do the work that we celebrate them for today. Too often our reading and hearing about black folks stops at the point of our oppression and remembering how black people have fought back somehow gets conveniently misplaced or demonized in popular narratives of United States history, for instance. A focus on who or what one is fighting for is a brand of activism that centers itself on black children and who black children can become, what black youth can accomplish or achieve, and the uncanny tenacity of black people to flourish despite persistent threats to our well-being. Centering possibility, then, is my urgent invitation that black education practice and policy be primarily guided by who or what we're fighting for and, to a far lesser extent, who or what we're fighting against. Do we recognize this institution? This university 
for as long as I can remember, has been mired in a contradiction of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Even from Project 500 and bringing black people and people of color here, and there still being numerous in instances of racial assault. And I remember being a student marching down Green Street uh, in protest to the latest racial uh, incident. And I also remember as a young person thinking about the future I wanted, the future that this university would allow me to have, having earned an education here, um, and being so optimistic that um, this place and the world could be much different than it is. But part of what I didn't recognize as a student that it already had a 125 plus year history of being what it was. And it wasn't a march down Green Street that was gonna change it. And so today, some 20 years later, I'm stuck contemplating what it means for me to concede the impossibility of this place and institutions like it to ever be any different than what they've always been. Progress is one thing, change is something completely different. So when I consider the theme for this series, will DEI, D-I-E, advocacy and action towards greater accountability in an empowered university, perhaps DEI absolutely should D-I-E. Perhaps it is time that we reconcile, despite good intention, the institution has no capacity to be better than it always has, that we concede it will never be more equitable, more inclusive, or more diverse, at least in its ideologies that govern its organization and culture, despite having more colorful people and personalities around a crooked table. In this moment, I invite us to contemplate how our justice work might look different if we refuse DEI and focus our accountabilities on the people who continue to be dispossessed and disenfranchised, rather than on the institutional agents paid to sustain the university's original function. How would our politics change? Perhaps we pivot towards funding our students' capacity to be subversive, to understand the power that they possess, and to notice the importance of negotiating pan-ethnic solidarities that lead them to build hidden knowledge economies in plain sight. That, in my mind, is an empowered university. Mourning is a heuristic. It is coming to grips with the reality of a thing, a forced pause, in part sobering us to realities we'd otherwise rather deny. It urges that we freedom dream because we have nothing else left to do, right? And we do it out of a desperation because our fight flows out of our desperation and the necessity that we learn how to reconcile that we have no other choice. It is in and through the space of mourning that we might glimpse possibility for alternative education futures. So then, when I consider greater accountability and the Empower University, I think of black children. And the images that you're going to see, these are all images that are um, in my book. When I decided to sit down and write a book on, center, on possibility, uh, having read and been really inspired by histories of the black power movement and Kelly's work, part of what he argues is that we needed art in the time and in social justice movements because art sort of articulates and gives voice and a language to worlds we have yet to apprehend. Uh, and so he talks how important it is for music and art um, to sort of be a part of our, our, our work. I think of different groups in this moment, differential responsibility for the labor needed to divine a better world for these children. Some of us should be building while others of us are indeed tearing down. And to that point, I will say that racism is a system of power that white ancestors created. It is a system of power that white people should have primary responsibility for dismantling. There is a significant, there's a significant responsibility that people of color and black people have for tending to and being responsible to the well-being of other people of color and other black people. Uh, and that in of itself is really important work. When you think about arguments for reparations, those arguments are not just about tearing down the institution. Because many of us, if we tore the institution down, I think about this uh, going to student rallies when I was a professor at Michigan State and getting those long lists of demands and thinking, if you tear the institution down and burn it down and do all of the, what's on this list, what are you going to build in this place? Because all of us have been um, sort of touched and we've been, our, our minds have been infiltrated by settler colonialism. So it's very easy to recreate the very thing that we're trying to burn down, right? And so it's to that point that I think a lot about um, the space of refusal and what it means then to center ourselves and what efforts they are, whether we call them DEI or something else, on black students and students of color well-being. 
To make this even more concrete, I think about how important the surrounding community has been to black students over the course of many years, even at this institution, when folks could not be housed in a residence hall and what it meant to go to North Champaign and found housing right in black communities. So how might allowing DEI to DIE as we presently know it make room for more coalition building with communities who exist at the fringes of this university? Coming to theorize possibility has meant returning to a place of mourning, read a period of darkness or blackness over and over again. First, by reckoning with the unfortunate long-term residual impacts of chattel slavery and settler colonialism through the centuries, even up to and beyond the Black Power Movement, and the beginnings of what we know now to be art and scholarship characteristic of the Black radical tradition. And while mourning constitutes a stopping point to life as we know it, Possibility is birthed from that stopping point to the degree that one invests themselves and in reads psychically transcending or escaping the circumstance of their precarity to center possibility. That is to center young people what they need and the social worlds that they build that in many ways refuse the present structures that DEI work tends to want to simply reform. So to this point, when I left uh, U of I, as I shared, um, taught on the west side and I taught uh, middle school math and I was the only black teacher in the school of all, at, the, at that time, what I would say very well-intended white women who I thought really cared a lot about wanting to do right by black kids and black boys. Um, and slowly started to come to a realization that folks just really struggle. So it sent me on this path to studying empathy. So much of my work has been looking at uh, student-teacher interactions for evidence of empathy with black boys. But part of what I've learned over the years and, and after that man got elected in 2016, I found that it was really important to my own well-being that I set myself and learned to sink myself further and further into the space of blackness such to discover the beauty and brilliance that I was taught not to recognize, both in myself and in my community. And so part of where I am now um, at Vanderbilt is working on building a research practice policy collaborative uh, that I'm terming the Possibility Project that aims to generate and leverage knowledge um, to nurture black youth well-being in education and beyond. And so the signature study that uh, my, my team and I are starting to work on is an examination of policies and practices that might be identified as transformational to understand the tensions associated with stewarding those policies in the ways that notions or conceptions of possibility by education stakeholders who are responsible for touching those policies sort of are driven by or guided by their conceptions of possibility. So the project really aims to examine the tensions associated with enacting transformational policy, right, to understand how folks think about possibility and then to think about how those notions of possibility are developed and nurtured with respect to broader visions of blackness and black freedom. And by transformational, I'm thinking about policy initiatives and practices that are uh, remaking existing policies and practices that are not reforming them, but recreating the work altogether that is aimed at eliminating structural threats, redressing harm, and acknowledging explicitly the residual impact and historical legacies of both shadow slavery and settler colonialism. From where I sit at present, I see black education as attending to black people's well-being, full stop. And while that may include forms of DEI work that is intended to help make a university or a school setting one that reduces harm and appreciates cultural difference, this talk is not about us not doing anything, right? It is to say that we consider how DEI is co-opted by social forces that would rather sustain the institution as it presently exists and then to reimagine the subject and focus of our energy in ways that empower the people whose lives are most imperiled here. The work, more importantly, is allowing DEI to die in the form of listening sessions and surveys, for institutionalizing, um, I'm sorry, for example, or, uh, and an Empower University enables and celebrates the difference that we seek to um, bring in and represent by institutionalizing support for minoritized groups to sustain themselves. There's long history of black folks who have done this for one another. And I think about this here. I know that there's some U of I undergraduate alums in the room. Can you just raise your hand? Who's here? So where do the black people stand at on this campus? Where's our black space? 
right outside the union. Right, the stoop. So, and I, I, I've been thinking about this because we, have, we don't even notice the ways that we sustain. We sort of do it innately, right? And what would it mean for the institution, rather than creating new committees, to notice how black people and black students, or youth, students of color, are sustaining one another and then institutionalizing support for the ways that we have already learned to keep one another and hold one another and pull one another through this, institutions, this institution. There's a long history, again, of black folks who have done this. And so I want to end here. You've probably seen this little video, but I thought this would be a nice ending. Thank you, the end. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for your enlightening words. And, um, Are we standing here? I guess we can go over there, yeah. Um, I'm following your lead. You can go over okay. there. Okay. <laughs> um, so we learned a lot about uh, some of the challenges to the work that institutions like the University of Illinois um, do for DEI, <clears throat> what aspects of DEI, in your opinion, that probably should die, um, and how we can uh, uh, integrate some of the solutions that you discussed in your talk um, to help uh, increase the possibilities for students on campuses like this to be more empowered, and for institutions to empower those types of students. So I'd like to open it up for more of a dialogue now with the audience. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that uh, sparked your interest and, and attention from, from the talk today. Um, we have a, a good amount of time to engage in this dialogue with Dr. Warren while, while we have him here. So um, uh, I'll go ahead and ask for volunteers by a show of hands if you have something that you wanted to remark or respond to or react to or that you just wanted more clarity on from what was said. So I, I guess I can uh, lead off with a, a question that was related to the talk and also that builds from your experiences as um, an undergraduate student here. Mm. Um, maybe the, the, the conversation around DEI work wasn't um, as front and center as it is now. Um, what, what, from your experience as a student, either here or in other institutions that you've been to, have you seen that has really personified the work that you're trying to push forward in your possibilities project. Is there some uh, clear example you can share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, I think some of it is in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a student here, and I guess in my life, I, I started really reflecting on this, obviously during the pandemic when lots of, we've all had lots of time to reflect on our own human fragility. Um, and regrets or things that we want to do and we didn't get to do. And we, I, I remember at least the first three months just mourning all my plans. And in that moment, part of what was sustaining me, much like 2016, was looking in the faces of people that I really cared about or um, finding art that really just made me happy, like black art. I'm a, a 
amateur art collector, I'm calling myself, uh, it brings me so much joy just to be embraced and surrounding myself with art and being in artistic spaces, um, but more importantly, to be in community with other black people. That has been really important to me. I feel like as a student here and in my life, the thing in terms of, and, and you can't slap DEI on to us deciding we gonna meet up for drinks on a Thursday night, right? Or we gonna take up space in uh, the resident hall student lounge because we just need to spend time building and affirming one another. And how negligent the institution can be to just noticing and allowing us the sort of room we need to be with one another. That is not complicated. Um, and I, I think about this now even as a professor uh, at Michigan State, um, we just had an abysmal um, black male student graduation rate. It was something like 40% uh, black male students graduating in six years when I was there. And we had this whole conversation in a room full of black students around how the university can incentivize them to actually just be there for one another. They are the best people to retain and sustain one another in an institution where they go into rooms like this one and they're the only. So I, I just think about that and what it would mean. What, it might cost the institution something, and this is where I think it becomes really challenging. Um, I appreciate this insight from Dave Stovall around, it's not justice unless there's a redistribution of resources away from those who have historically had it to those who have historically not had it, but that causes a lot of discomfort. And it also causes the institution to concede power, and uh, what happens when institutions concede power, we get January 6th. Uh, we get people who are recognizing the ways that they have tacitly benefited from systems that they don't know any different, right? Um, and how significant and the visceral response and the political will of an institution to respond to not the people who are getting the resources that they very well deserve and the access that they very well deserve, but to respond to the people who are now committed to forms of violence as a result of their loss. That's significant. Um, so this is what I'm saying. When we, we need to differentiate, uh, and any of those of us who work in higher ed, whatever your role is, you understand the black tax. You know what it means to do far more than what you're paid to do, uh, but you do it because you recognize that if you don't, who will? And we would rather do the extra work than allow young people to sort of slip away, so. We have uh, two questions. We'll go to the right uh, first. If you can in introduce yourself, please. Hi, Ritu. The we being the people who get to who get scapegoated, like they hire you and you got to do the work, and then they get. It. I think it's both. Okay. It's a two-part question. One, those who get hired and sort of now you're labeled your decision right. And then the organization, the institution. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to the former, I think we have to be clear what our relationship is to the institution. 
I sort of talked a little bit about, you know, being a student, eyes wide open, I'm gonna change the world, right? This institution, uh, and I remember coming to a place like U of I, not thinking that I belonged here, or I didn't even know how I got in. I had a, a 19 on the ACT. So me being admitted felt like this is a big deal. I'm a guest here. My classmates were customers and they treated the place as such. But I think part of, from that experience to where I sit now, uh, you know, it's a shame to say in 2022, but as the first black senior professor in my department, and you know, folks are sort of patting themselves on the back for that, and it's a shame. But what I understand, having gone there and chosen to go there and sort of be uh, in the belly of, of the beast in, in one way or another, um, when we work in these types of institutions, is to recognize that I have no responsibility to changing this place. I'm clear about the capacity of the institution to love me. It cannot. And Gloria Lassie Bellin says this all the time. The, the institution has no capacity to love us, right? They love my labor. They don't love me. And I'm clear about the, the fact that they care about my labor. So my orientation is, okay, I have a space of influence here that I can leverage. I recognize my relationship to the institutional, to institution to be a bit transactional, and I'm going to take up space. And I'm going to create lanes and pathways and opportunities for as many students who will want to come you know, and, and be connected to what it is in the work that I'm attempting to do. Uh, that is what's important to me. And I think if we don't kind of go in clear eyed about what the, what the place is and what it has capacity to do, we sort of create uh, opportunities for ourselves to be disenfranchised. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a real thing. And on the other side, um, I don't know. I really, I don't know that I have an answer for the org what the organization should be doing. I mean, we're in a room of people who occupy various spaces in the institution, um, past, present, future. Um, I think it behooves all of us, something that's occurring to me, uh, in my years of being a teacher educator in particular, the worst thing that any one of my white women teacher candidates uh, would want to be thought of is as racist. I don't want to be, and what I will say, it's much worse to actually be racist. It's much worse to exercise use of your privilege and power in a way that creates conditions of disadvantage for your classmates or your future students. That's much worse. Being called racist is not a huge deal. If anything, it should call you out of a place and open you up to the possibility that you have some ways of seeing and being in the world where you're not recognizing yourself. You're looking in the mirror, but you're not seeing yourself. Right. And part of what critical whiteness studies teaches us in part is that white folks don't know when and where they're being problematic. And the first time they're being told is the first time they're starting to wake up, because unlike people of color, many white families are not having conversations with their children about race. Right. We don't have a race. We don't have a culture. I'm American. So I think about organizations similarly in the sense that we get jobs, we get trained, we, we apply, we move up the career ladder. We know these issues are important, but they're not central to our day to day. And so we sort of uh, allow ourselves to be blinded to uh, and not to be ableist, but to not notice or to be color evasive, as Suvini Anima would say, um, to the ways that we are complicit. And when I have these types of conversations, my goal and opportunity is not to force you to be this way or that way to follow my example or not, but it is to give you, give you some tools to think about yourself in relationship to the place. And when I say to mourn and perhaps DEI should die, that, that's an invitation to notice us for what we are today, not for what our ideal is. We know the Constitution and the Declaration is an ideal, but the framers of that Constitution did not have many of us in mind when they, when they wrote it. And they built an entire system out of what they wrote. So we can't continue to pursue an ideal and look past and, and fail to embrace the, the subject reality right, uh, of our existence here. Mm. And thinking of this concept of relative understanding of the 
reflections that you're telling about possibility are, are uh, easily are easily relatable when adapted to other countries mm -hmm. and to uh, post-colonial this post-colonial trauma, right? I can think to uh, indigenous communities in Peru after a generation of my grandmother who live in situations of basically slavery till the till, till the Great Revolution of the seventies, right? And um, this uh, it's really powerful this this concept that you are that you are mentioning that. Uh, sometimes those in, th those institutions of power or, or those institutions that, that allow that power dynamic dynamics are not recognized by the same groups that uh, that instill that kind of op oppression, right? Mm. In Peru, it's it's, 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 it's literally crazy. I mean, we're talking about like one percent less than zero point point ten percent of, of of people, of white people who have mass own wealth, right? And, mm. and the racial relationship between white people, and we're talking about actually white people, right? Mm. And, and, and mixed color people, and, and what they call cholos, what they call uh, mestizo and indigenous people, mm. it's very similar to what you are describing. And also, it's really powerful how we could leverage from this concept of possibility yeah. in the case of, of education. In yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I will say really quickly, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about, I mean, something that I try to help my students to understand is that a, I think a, a foremost, a primary project of white supremacy is to uh, create binaries and to create sort of flattened um, understandings of the world such that there is no possibility for plurality and expansive notions of anything. Everything has to be in this box or in this box. I got my DEI person right over here. We have checked the box, right? Um, and it's, it means something completely different to say to a group of people, we have a problem. And I think about this as somebody who's done youth participatory action research. To teach young people how to identify problems, they know what the problems are. All I did was just give them some language. And they look around and they like, well, we don't like that the curriculum is like this. Why do football players get more than the theater kids? They, they come up with all the problems and then they come up with questions that they want to ask to respond to those problems. W what about our work in the institution limits us from that sort of imagine, imagination? Uh. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, in Latin America, in, in Peru, there's this notion of the Peruvian creativity, right? And it's boxing like it's just it's like boxing this mass uh, mixed race and indigenous uh, population as just a force of labor and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but nothing beyond nothing else beyond that, right? Yeah. Okay, let's uh, get a uh, some I more. I love this guy. He's had his hand up. Um, yeah. Right here up in front. Bobby. Bobby. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Wallace, for your presentation. Bobby Jason is the second from the Department of Black Studies here. Um, I really enjoy um, you censoring a lot of these because we're pretty um, dreams. And thinking with this work, I'm wondering how do we center students in an empowering university for you to build a social movement? When you know that Kelly argues that what black people need to do is build social movements and learn from social movements. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about the black power movement, the black radical tradition. Even like black studies were born out of student uprisings. Right. So how do we empower students to take on this question mm -hmm. of DEI and take this in their own hands? Um, the student is a, you know, I, I enjoyed the, the portrait of the student, how students gather around them. How can we begin to institutionalize it, not wait for the university to do it, but how can we empower students? To mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So there are a couple things that are coming to mind. One, um, when I got to Vanderbilt, one of the things that I had intention on uh, is creating this black reading collective amongst Peabody gradu black graduate students. And I just started with my graduate student. I'm, I'm telling my business if somebody from Peabody's not watching. Uh, this is probably no longer fugitive. But um, <laughs> they, I said, go find the people and let's read together. Let's I really regret two things as a student. Never taking a black studies course and nobody inviting me to or encouraging that I did. I lived in the black house. Um, and I regret it never dawning on me that if you're a black student at this institution, you need to enroll in Afro 100, <laughs> all right? Uh, and two, being in the College of Education and never accessing Jim Anderson's work. 
he was on the third floor. And I never, ever saw his work until I was a third year doctoral student. I regret that. And I think there's some responsibility for those of us who are here who are touching this institution just to pass a word, right? And I'm sure that obviously I am here in part because of people who are in this room. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying that um, uh, as an indictment, right? But I, I think how important it is just to see a young person, to, I, I use this language of young people, they'd be 18 and 19 and 20, but to see them and to talk to them and to pull them along and say, Let's have lunch or whatever. I, I, I think part of the middle school part of the middle school teacher part of me is I can't see a black student on campus and not just nod at them. That was something that we were sort of trying to do here uh, in the orientation that they no longer have. But uh, to just see each other. Um, and I think that that's an important piece, because as we start to um, just get access to the information. There's not, a, I think, a lot of work that we have to do to push young people to see the world for what it is. We just, they need to need access to the perspectives and to the lenses. Uh, and I see that as really important. And the other point I want to make uh, to that is part of what we can learn from a Black Lives Matter movement is that it's a leaderless movement. And uh, my colleague Ashley Woodson has written about the ways that we um, messianize um, black leadership. And, and what that means then for, and I think about this in Ferguson, what it meant for like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson to show up in Ferguson when organizers there were already doing the work. Uh, and how do we empower young people to be the leaders that they need and not to be looking for somebody else? Um, and that doesn't always mean be on a pulpit. I say you find your revolutionary act, whatever that looks like, and to let them know no matter how big or how small, every part plays a, plays a part is important. Comment and then I see the dean had her hand up as well. Um, so Nathan, if you can make it short, <laughs> yeah, we'll wrap it up. Sorry, I just have a question because you have me thinking a lot about like the stories that you've shared. Um, so I'm Nathan, by the way, and I'm a fourth year PhD student in EPOL, um, and I think a lot about history of education as well as educational leadership, right? And so some, some of the things that you said, um, like we're talking about Kelly as well as had me thinking about like tuck and gangs, refusing research and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that both of them talk about are like the amnesia or forgetting is like requiring mm. the proliferation of white supremacy and mm. colonization. And so I'm curious to, to know what your thoughts are about how people in positions of power who have the ability to do those investments like you were talking about, investing in, in students um, how do we facilitate remembering among that, those, that group of people? And how do we sort of translate that into the refusal? Like, how, I guess, how do we translate refusal into an investment? Mm. Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> the first thing that's occurring to me is how important traditions are and rights. Um, yeah, traditions and uh, rites and rituals. Um, and I think about this even in you know, African traditions, just uh, having um, ways of incorporating, adopting, orienting people into community. And that being a symbol or a marker of your experience and the thing that continues to draw you back um, to community. And I think about how then does the university um, even support, on the, I'm, I'm thinking about this dually. On the one hand, how they know about it and support it, but on the other hand, how it continues to operate completely absent. Because sometimes when people wrap themselves around it, they also find ways to control it. And we, we also don't want that. So I, I need to think on that some more. I think it's a really, it's a big question, but the remembering piece is really important too. Uh, I say this really quickly. When we talk about the issue, retention, persistence, whatever, are we centering on the pain or are we thinking about the students who, who did finish and what enabled them to finish? The, the reframe, the counter narrative. Um, how often do we incorporate or understand what people did to survive here as um, 
as evidence and instruction, and which would include the painful parts. But I'm also, it's troubling to continue to hear all of the painful narratives as like a foregrounding to what the work needs to be. Because some of us leave because we decided, F this, I don't want, I don't want this anymore. Uh, and I talk about this in my book, Urban Preparation. The, but there were black boys who went to college and for the first time they got to college and it was the first time that they had freedom, like the, the self-determination to be able to decide, I actually don't want to persist here. And that's okay too. They didn't get it in high school. They didn't get it as young people. They got to college and it was the first time they got to determine the future that they wanted. And we also, I think, need to make room for that. Um, for young people to say, I don't want this, I'm refusing this. And that be its own right. Okay. Okay, we're at the top of the hour and I just wanted to, um, Dean Moses, you wanted to say a final word or you're okay? Okay, All right. I know we're gonna be joining. We're going to lunch. lunch after <laughs> so I wanna thank you. Thank Dr. you. Warren, for your remarks here. Thank you.